I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, pro-life push. Lawmakers in South Carolina revisit a plan to ban abortion after six weeks. Respecting dignity. A closer look at a bipartisan effort to address immigration reform. Controversial curveball. Analysis after the Los Angeles Dodgers make an announcement about a transgender group. And celebrating the Eucharist. The Vatican has released the theme, date, and location of the 53rd International Eucharistic Congress. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, negotiations continue tonight between the White House and GOP lawmakers over the debt ceiling. Politicians are offering assurance that the government will figure out a way to avoid default. But around the country, economic anxiety is rising. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Another day of talks, but so far, no word tonight of any deal. As they say, it's literally coming down to the wire. Now, negotiators are trying to hammer out numbers all sides can agree to. In the White House press briefing room, the press secretary addresses the debt ceiling debate. A default would have catastrophic impacts in every single part of this country, whether you're in a red state or in a blue state. Earlier in the day, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy told reporters. I'm sending our negotiation team down to the White House to, to try to finish up the negotiations with the White House. There's a number of places that we are still far apart. McCarthy also said it did not seem like it would be this hard. He also emphasized he would not raise taxes. Why? Because we got more revenue coming in to our coffers at any time in American history. Meanwhile, it was not a question of if, but when. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis with plans to announce his 2024 presidential campaign on Twitter in an online conversation with Twitter CEO Elon Musk. Governor DeSantis is seen as former President Donald Trump's leading rival for the GOP nomination. And CNN has announced it'll host a town hall with Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley. It'll be held live in Iowa on Sunday, June 4th, 8 p.m. Eastern. And in New Hampshire today, Haley said she'd sign a federal abortion ban as president if there's consensus. I think if there's, you know, if there's 60 votes, which we're not anywhere near that, and if there's something where they've come together on consensus, yes, of course I would sign it because that's 60 you know, 60 votes out of 100 saying this is what America wants. But we're at 45, so we're not anywhere close. Now, also today in the White House press briefing room, I was able to ask a question about Senator Tommy Tuberville and his fight for pro-life taxpayers. Corrine, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, two separate questions for you. One on Senator Tuberville. You know, he continues to prevent or hold up Pentagon promotions. He says the DOD's new abortion policy is illegal. And he says taxpayer dollars should not be funding abortions. And he's got a lot of support. There's a petition going around right now supporting his stance. Uh, what does the White House say to Americans who agree with Senator so I'll Tuberville? I'll say this. Uh, I'll speak to the Senator Tuberville. Is, is, he's threatening, right, our national security with uh, his political gamemanship. That's what we're seeing from the senator. And risking our military readiness by depriving armed forces of leadership and harming military families. That is what's currently happening. That is what uh, is, uh, the senator is, is threatening here. Now, the press secretary urged the senator to drop his holds, but he is not budging. Meanwhile, tonight, today marks one year to the tragic day, 19 young lives, and two teachers, 19 students and two teachers were killed by a gunman at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. And President Biden delivered remarks this afternoon remembering and honoring those children and the educators who lost their lives, calling it a really tough day for all the families, adding that remembering is important but painful as well. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. A lawmakers in South Carolina appear set to renew a pro-life measure banning abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. One state senator says the bill is what the voters want. Yes, I certainly believe the majority of South Carolinians, Carolinians value life. 
The proposal would restore a ban that South Carolina had in place when Roe v. Wade was overturned. The law was struck down by the state's Supreme Court over right to privacy violations. Republican Governor Henry McMaster says that he will sign the new measure. An adjunct professor at a New York City college caught on video vandalizing a pro-life display has been fired. The teacher at Hunter College also insulted pro-life students and called their work, quote, propaganda. She also allegedly threatened a reporter with a knife after he tried to interview her. And we go now to Amber Athey, Washington editor at The Spectator and author of The Snowflakes Revolt, How Woke Millennials Hijacked American Media. Amber, great to have you back on. Uh, a lot to get to today. But first, I want to get your thoughts on that professor in New York and those disturbing outbursts and threats. I'm really glad to hear that she was fired. Someone who would threaten a reporter the way that she did has no business being around young people and educating young minds, not to mention the fact that she had vandalized that pro-life display and essentially accused the pro-life activists of perpetuating violence, which is a great irony considering the fact that she, a few days later, was wielding a machete to someone who was trying to ask her questions about it. And unfortunately, these types of educators are the ones across the country in colleges indoctrinating young people and teaching them that people who have dissenting opinions from them are committing violence against them. So it's a good reminder of where that ideology comes from. Yeah, and I want to pivot now to some uh, big news today on the political front. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis officially throwing his hat into the ring for the 2024 presidential race and filing his paperwork today. Your reaction and what does this mean for the Republican presidential primary race? This seems like it was coming for a long time, and it's uh, quite exciting that it's been officially made official, so to speak. And um, I think that his announcement uh, plans are quite interesting. He's going to be going on a Twitter space with Elon Musk, as opposed to announcing through tradi traditional media measures or through a speech. So I wonder if that's going to reduce the number of people who can actually listen to his announcement. It's also audio only. Um, but I think that we'll see a lot of attempts by DeSantis to try to distinguish himself from the front runner, which is former President Donald Trump. He'll most likely talk about Florida's COVID policy and how the state refused to lock down for long periods of time. He'll also probably point a lot to his fight in his state against woke corporations, ESG standards, and radical gender ideology in schools, and will likely say that former President Trump did not do enough on those issues when he was in a position to do so. Amber, I want to go back to that, uh, him making that announcement on, on Twitter spaces, uh, a tool not really typically used for such a, a big moment. Uh, and a lot of people aren't familiar, familiar, that is, with that. Tell us more about it. What do you make of this tactic? And why do you think he's doing this? Right. It's a very interesting tactic, as I said, because this is an audio only platform and he'll be uh, he'll be in a moderated conversation with one of Elon Musk's closest confidants, basically doing an interview type format. And even a lot of people who use Twitter on a daily basis have never used the spaces function. And it's also prone to a lot of technical difficulties. So if they have millions of people presumably listening in to DeSantis's announcement, I think a lot of people are going to be holding their breath that it's going to go off without a hitch from a technical standpoint. And then I wonder if the DeSantis team has thought about whether or not this will potentially diminish the ability of a lot of people to actually listen to what he has to say in the announcement, since it is such a non-traditional media method. And I think what DeSantis is signaling here is that he's not someone who has played ball with the traditional media landscape. He does not give interviews or access to mainstream media or corporate media outlets. And his campaign um, in the past, as well as his governor's office, has been relatively leak-free because he keeps a very close team. So I think that's just signaling that he's uh, a different man than Trump, who, of course, announced his, or not announced, but recently had a CNN town hall where he discussed what his platform would be for um, if he were reelected in 2024. Amber, we have about 30 seconds left or so, but curious what else you're following. Absolutely. It looks like Target has recently started pulling off some of the pride-related uh, apparel for children that they were advertising in their stores. However, 
They haven't apologized. Instead, they've actually blamed the right for allegedly threatening employees in response to this. So they're still going to be facing backlash and boycotts for uh, marketing that type of content towards children. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Amber, always great to get your insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, a bipartisan group of House lawmakers is trying to do what has not been done in 36 years, pass comprehensive immigration reform. The bill could offer a path to citizenship for undocumented migrants in the U.S. It would also invest in border security. Republican Congresswoman Maria Alvera Salazar and Democrat Veronica Escobar are leading the effort. This is a historical moment. Two members of Congress, one Democrat and one Republican, have decided to work on one of the most divisive topics in this country, immigration. Who wants to do that? Very few people. The time has come. It is long past time that Congress take action. The Dignity Act combines a number of priorities from previous Republican and Democrat bills. The measure boosts funding for border patrol and border barriers and shortens legal wait times for asylum seekers to two months. Creates a dignity program giving undocumented immigrants legal status if they pay taxes and fees and pass a criminal background check. It also includes the DREAM Act, allowing children illegally brought to the U.S. to apply for citizenship. I don't want anyone to confuse amnesty with dignity. This is not amnesty. Amnesty is what the undocumented have right now and have had for 30 years. Republican Congressman Mike Lawler argues that a path to citizenship for migrants is essential. You want people to be able to come here to work. Immigrants contribute to our economy, to our culture, and to our communities. We want them to do, do, do so, but we want them to do so legally. The measure has picked up some early support from Democrat Senator Chris Coons, who said in a statement, quote, I applaud Rep Salazar and Escobar for their leadership in introducing the Bipartisan Dignity Act. Their legislation is an important step forward. The sponsors say their bill faces a tough road ahead. The minute it's released, we will hear an uproar from the right, and the left about all the things it does and all the things it, la it leaves undone. Yes. But we cannot let the illusion of a perfect bill yeah. prevent us from doing what is right. Well, the Dignity Act comes on the heels of a GOP-passed House bill placing severe limits on asylum. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is urging Congress to come up with real immigration reform that includes respectful treatment of migrants. While Catholic priest has been killed in Mexico, it is the ninth death in the last four years. Father Javier Garcia Villafana appeared to have been shot while he was driving. The country's bishops' conference condemned the killing and is calling for authorities to find those responsible. Also in Mexico, the Archbishop of Durango was attacked in his own sacristy by a knife-wielding man. Police believe it was an attempted murder and have arrested an 80-year-old man. The Mexican Bishops Conference thanked the Virgin of Guadalupe for, for the protection of the bishop. Uh, Russia's prime minister is in China for official talks with high-ranking officials in the communist country. <laughs> The leaders spoke of growing bilateral trade between the two nations. They also took part in a signing ceremony for an agreement to enhance service trade, agricultural products, and even sports. Beijing has become a major trading partner for Moscow. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including speaking out why a Catholic group is pushing back against a major league baseball team and spreading the gospel. Pope Francis asked for prayers for the people of one communist nation. We'll explain. Well, the Republican governor of Montana has signed a measure banning people dressed in drag from reading to children in schools or in libraries. Governor Greg Giafonte signed the bill saying such content is inappropriate for children. Montana is the first state to enact this sort of ban. Well, as we reported yesterday, the Los Angeles Dodgers will now recognize an anti-Catholic transgender group 
at an event next month. The team previously had disinvited the group known as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence following pushback from church leaders and fans. The new decision has spurred one Catholic group into action. Catholic Vote has announced that it is launching a $1 million ad campaign against the Major League Baseball team and demanding it stop making a mockery of the Catholic faith. The Archdiocese of Los Angeles has also expressed its disappointment in the Dodgers' decision. The Archdiocese says around 30 percent of the population of Los Angeles is Catholic. And joining us now to talk more about this is Brian Birch, president of Catholic Vote. Brian, great to have you back on. Uh, a lot to unpack here, but first, let's talk about this group, the uh, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Uh, I would venture to say that most people have not heard of them until recently. Well, hopefully you haven't heard of them because they're one of the most vile, grotesque, and, and sacrilegious organizations out there. They're not sisters. They are homosexual men who dress up as nuns in order to mock the Catholic faith. Uh, they participate in sacrilegious and blasphemous rituals. They've stolen the Eucharist and desecrated it in a sexual act. Uh, they've, uh, they have condom masses. They have uh, names they call themselves and aren't even appropriate. They've you know, uh, gyrated on a cross. Their entire purpose is to mock and to make fun of Catholics and particularly Catholic nuns. And it's just detestable that a major league baseball team would not just invite them, but to select them out as an organization that will receive an honor and an award during Pride Night in middle in middle June. Yeah, it's unbelievable, Brian. Um, I want to talk about your ad campaign. Um, tell us more about this and, and what you hope comes from it. Well, as you reported, the Dodgers did rescind the invite and then a couple days later uh, uh, re-invited them and apologized for rescinding the invite. This came after massive pressure from gay rights groups. And in our opinion, Catholics need to stand up and fight back. You know, we're part of the fan base, too, of baseball. Uh, Catholics make up 30 percent of the population of Los Angeles, as you suggest. And we've uh, now announced that we will uh, launch this million dollar campaign. We're raising money for this uh, and we will launch ads on billboards, on Spanish radio, on television, on every Dodgers based media entity possible in order to alert fans and to push back against these woke corporations that now not are, aren't just sexualizing and, and doing kind of this scandalous Pride Month things, but now uh, incorporating anti-Catholic bigotry into these activities. Yeah, it, it really is mind blowing. Um, you know, I talk about the Dodgers now and their Catholic background because we know they have one. Their longtime radio announcer, Vin Scully, is not only Catholic, but uh, soon after his retirement, Hi, he prayed the rosary for too. Catholic athletes for Christ. So what do you think he would think about all of this? Well, uh, God bless the late announcer and uh, many other Dodgers. Uh, Coach Tommy Lasorda, of course, was a very proud Catholic. Many Dodgers, Mike Piazza, Steve Garvey, Gil Hodges, so many others. The Dodgers organization was run by a good Catholic family for many years until they sold about a decade ago. And unfortunately, this new ownership group seems willing to now smack Catholics back in the face with this stunt they're going to pull in mid-June. And again, Catholics at some point need to stand up and say enough is enough. We're not going to allow our faith to be mocked and scandalized, particularly in this way, to use nuns, women who devote themselves in service of the church, to allow them to be the, the instruments of mockery and denigration. And, and, and frankly, this is an embarrassment for not just the Dodgers, but for all of Major League Baseball. Yeah. Brian, I'm curious, um, who are some of the other voices speaking out against all of this? What are you hearing? Well, as you pointed out, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, the Archbishop of San Francisco, of uh, the Diocese of Orange, these are all surrounding dioceses. Uh, we are waiting to hear from some players who I understand may be speaking out, as well as some other professional athletes. You also have many fans. If you go on social media, so many fans are just outraged. Even today, we heard from a Jewish rabbi in Los Angeles who was so embarrassed by his hometown team. And he said, you know, I love baseball, but I love God more. Beautiful. Brian, we have probably 20 seconds left or so, but any final thoughts before I let you go? Yeah, if you're watching this, uh, you know, 
don't don't think you can't do anything. The example of Anheuser Busch and Bud Light, now Target, now the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, when enough people stand up and speak their mind and defend what we believe, we can ha make a difference, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do here. All right, sounds good, Brian. Thank you so much for coming on and getting your insights. Uh, we always appreciate it. God bless. Thank you so much. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, global gathering, new developments in the next Eucharistic Congress, plus a major milestone. A religious order dedicated to the Immaculate Conception is celebrating a special anniversary. Pope Francis is asking for prayers for the people in China. In effect, this disciple of the Lord signifies to follow him, to follow his path. At his weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father asked that the gospel be fully and freely shared in the communist country, adding that the risen Christ can bring beauty and freedom to all of Chinese society. Well, the Vatican has announced the dates and location for the 53rd International Eucharistic Congress. It will take place in Quito, Ecuador on September, in September 2024. The theme is, You Are All My Brothers. The event seeks to serve as a reminder that the church should always be a place of inclusion and hospitality. Well, a religious order founded in Poland and dedicated to the Immaculate Conception is celebrating a major milestone this year. EWTN Vatican journalist Benjamin Crockett has more. The Congregation of Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary is a fraternal community of consecrated life that has as its primary purpose the proclamation of devotion to the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are currently celebrating the 350-year jubilee of their founding. Well, we were founded 350 years ago in Poland. Our founder was St. Stanislaus Papczynski. He had belonged to the um, Pierist fathers, and they had taught um, uh, poor children. But he felt a, an impression in his heart from the Holy Spirit to found a community dedicated to the Immaculate Conception, the mystery of the Immaculate Conception. The Pierists actually are dedicated to Mary as well. The Marian Fathers are primarily known for their devotion to Mary Immaculate, their active service to the Church, and their dedication to praying for the poor souls. Well, we pray for the souls in every Mass. Uh, we pray in a special way during the month of November uh, when uh, we visit cemeteries and, and we pray for the dead. Uh, we have the All Saints Day and All Souls Day. But it's really something to remember all the time because there are people dying every day unprepared to meet the Lord. Unfortunately, in our society today, we, we don't want to think about death. We don't want to think about uh, what, what's to come. And so people are suddenly unprepared for what is to come. So it's important that we are prepared to, to meet the Lord. And so the best way to prepare is, is a life lived well uh, with the sacraments, with uh, mass, with going to confession and things like that. On February 17th, 2023, in the Consistory Hall, Pope Francis granted a special audience to the participants of the general chapter of the Congregation of Marian Fathers and the House in Rome. When we had the meeting with the Holy Father in uh, February, he was talking about all the soldiers who were dying unprepared with all the wars that were going on right now. The spirit of assisting souls was dear to the heart of St. Stanislaus. His conviction was to beg God earnestly for the release of souls who find themselves in expiatory flames or to come to their help by pious alms as well as by various other means is to exercise the highest charity. Today, the Marian congregation has over 500 priests and brothers who labor in 19 countries, including the United States, Argentina, Belarus, Brazil, Cameroon, Germany, India, Kazakhstan, the Philippines, Poland, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, and Ukraine. Father Wojciech Jasinski, Marian father from Poland, sees the mission of the congregation as more relevant now than ever. Even for people who don't see any sense in, in their lives, we could say, look, uh, God loves you, and it, God wanted you, that your life has a deep sense, that you, you can always see that you, there is someone who always loves you, which is, which is God. In Rome, Benjamin Crockett, EWTN News Nightly. 
And finally tonight, the Knights of Columbus has released a documentary about the life and legacy of a Catholic priest killed in a POW camp in 1951. The movie also examines the decades-long search for his remains. He read the story that in, the, in the magazine. It reminded him, well, this is the priest that I knew. The magazine and the miracle, Finding Father Capon, examines the incredible circumstances that led to the finding of the remains of Father Emil Capon. It also details the efforts to bring Father Capon to his new resting place in a cathedral in his native Kansas. And for more information and to view the 15-minute short film, visit kofc.org. And we thank the Knights of Columbus for its support of EWTN News Nightly. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.